From his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is the talk show Hell Hates. The more you listen, the more you know why. Good to be with you today. That beautiful, beautiful weather we are having in the Midwest part of the country. Actually, it's the, the mid. I don't know why they call it Midwest. It's the mid. Uh, back in 1980, the geographic population center of the United States was located about seven miles from my house. It's a true story. From 1980 to 1990, the population center of the United States was in DeSoto, named after Hernando de Soto, a, one of those Spanish explorers, uh, Missouri, DeSoto, Missouri which is where uh, the former governor, Jay Nixon, came from. So this is the mid of America. But anyway, good to be with you today. I was reading um, uh, yesterday I took Sweetie Pie to the doctor, and then I did my study. Monday is usually my, one of my big study days. I did my study from home. We just went home afterward, but before we went home, we went to a store that's sort of like a, it's a resale shop like Goodwill, only a little bit less dusty merchandise in this one. And they have a huge book area, and I was going through it, and I saw that they had a big collection of these bookshelf books, books that people buy that they never read. They put on bookshelves because it makes the bookshelf look good. And it was the writings of the philosophers. And one of them was Aristotle. And I'm thinking, maybe, hmm, maybe I'll get me a pipe and I'll grow a goatee beard and I'll read Aristotle so that I can say, I've read Aristotle. So I open it up, and I'm just thumbing through it, and I start reading selected places from it, just at random. And as I'm reading it, I'm going, you know, I can read the book of Proverbs a lot cheaper and get a lot more out of it than I can this. So I put it back on the shelf, and so this morning I did. I am uh, was reading through the book of Proverbs, um, which gave me an idea for today. Uh, a few years ago, I was going through a really tough time here at our church. It's happened before. Um, this year has been tough, but it's not an unheard of situation. It's happened before. It'll happen again. Uh, but several years ago, I was going through a really tough time, and um, God was dealing with me, and, and he said, I want you to read Proverbs. So I did. I read the book of, entire book of Proverbs, and I went, okay, God, that was great. What do you want me to read now? And God said, read it again. Oh, so I read it again. And I said, okay, God, that was, that was even better than the last time. What do you want me to read now? God said, read it again. And this next time through, I'm noticing these two women in Proverbs. And the contrast between them. The strange woman, she's foolish. Her steps will lead you right down to hell. 
The other woman is um, it describes her as wisdom, and she will, if you will follow her, she cries out in the streets. And if you'll follow her, she'll lead you to eternal life. And um, so I was reading that part about wisdom hath hewed out her seven pillars. So I'm going to talk about that today. Uh, but I, I told a lady that wrote in, apparently there was an election in Canada and nobody told me. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't vote. I'm, I apologize. I didn't cast my ballot. I would have voted for anybody not named Trudeau. Okay, would have done it in a heartbeat. Uh, but and Trudeau is basically Canada's Obama or Clinton, and he wants everybody to believe that he is this progressive liberal that is on everybody's side except right wingers. And these people are so hypocritical. It's not even liberals are so are the biggest hypocrites ever. Mark my word. And Trudeau is, the Clintons were, oh, the Obamas are, the Pelosi's, the Bidens, they're all hypocrites, every one of them. And I know some people who are dyed in the wool, staunch Southern Labor Democrats and hypocrites. Because I know for a fact the people that I personally know that are Democrats are against gun control. They are against sodomite weddings. They are against abortion, or they say they are. And yet they vote Democrat every year. I don't I don't get it. I don't get it. That's hypocrisy. So the email that I got, apparently from a Canadian A, eh? um they this person stayed up and watched the election results as we will in the year 2020. And, of course, Trudeau wins again. And she asked, God, how can this happen? Now, I did the same thing the second time Obama, Obama was elected. And the thought occurred to me, Mike, apparently you don't live in the country you thought you lived in. Now... Whatever whatever you don't like or do like about Donald Trump, you have to admit he's not Hillary. Flat out. And that's apparently... Don't believe this mainstream news media garbage about... The Russians hacked the election. That didn't happen. Didn't happen. The Democrats and the liberals want you to think, because they don't like the fact that they can't buy out nor scare Donald Trump. They don't like that. They can't control the man. So they're trying to get him impeached, and this whole thing with Russia is a, is a ruse. It's about... Getting this idea of him being impeached, which is never going to happen, to get it into the minds of people at the time of the election. That's all this is about. Don't think that they're actually going to impeach him. They know they're not going to impeach him. They know that they don't have the evidence to impeach him. Now, the House can deliver articles of impeachment to the Senate, but the Senate is not going to touch this. But anyway, um, where was I going with that? It was pretty good there. I was on a roll there for a second. Um, 
Anyway. Oh, it was Trump is not Hillary. People came out of the woodwork and jumped out of their party voting instincts to vote against Hillary Clinton. Because that woman is scary to a lot of people. Having her, I mean, everybody knows she is the most corrupt woman to ever run for public office. And putting her in the Oval Office would have been a very scary thing to do. So I, I still don't think we have this awesome Christian nation. I don't believe that. And it's the same in Canada. Now, this this lady wrote me and said, should we have prayed more? Should we have fasted more? I don't understand. And understand this. It doesn't take more people to get God's attention. That's not who God is. Jesus himself told us, regarding prayer, he said, don't do what the heathen do. Don't use vain repetitions, for they think they'll be heard for their much speaking. What does that tell you about how God listens to prayer? It doesn't take one more person. If we would have had one more person to pray, maybe we could have won this election. God doesn't roll that way, people. He gives, see, there's something you got to understand. God gives and sets up the rulers over nations that he wants. It's that simple. God raises up kings, he brings them down. God raises up governments in nations, he brings them down. He does it according to his will, his glory, his purpose. It's not a it's not a matter of if we could have just got more people to pray and fast, then we would have won the if we could have done more. Now what you're talking about is works-based or performance-based blessings from God and that is not God. That's not the God that we worship. The God we worship doesn't need more from us or demand more from us before he acts. Elijah was a man of like passions, as you and I, the Bible says. And yet, when it came down to it, Elijah prayed one prayer one time, and it didn't rain for three and a half years, and he prayed one time again, and we have the sound of abundance of rain. The prophets of Baal screamed, cried, cut themselves, banged on drums, danced until almost the going down of the sun, trying to get Baal to answer their prayer to send fire down from heaven, and Baal doesn't show up. Elijah shows up, walking there. I can just see him with his hands. He's in, his, he's in his overalls, hands stuck in his pockets, and he's whistling Amazing Grace, and he walks up and he prays one prayer, and God sends fire down from heaven. One prayer, that's it. That's God. Um, I remember years ago, the uh, second Gulf War, when we invaded Iraq, which we didn't need to apparently, but we invaded Iraq, and I remember there was a um, a mega church pastor who now has been discovered as being a not only a sodomite but a methamphetamine freak as well. His name was uh, Haggard. Not Hoggard, Haggard. And he, he was hooked in with some big prayer retreat place. And he posted something online that said, 
God is God woke me up in the middle of the night and told me if we can get one million people to pray, this was after 9-11, before we were going to send troops to Iraq. And Haggard posted that God told him that if one million people would pray, then no American blood would be shed in this war in Iraq. So as the flag-draped coffins start rolling in from Iraq, I wrote this prayer center about what the Reverend Haggard said that God told him. And I asked the question, did we not get a million people to pray because obviously American lives are being lost now? So is that what happened? And they deflected the issue. They said, well, that didn't come from us. That came from Pastor Haggard. You'll have to ask him. But it was facetious of me anyway, because I knew the answer. It's not that God wants to hear one more prayer, and then he'll act. That's not, that's not what the Bible teaches us. If I'm drowning, how many times do I have to ask God to save me before he'll answer it? If God knows I'm drowning, I mean, the disciples came to Jesus with, Carest thou not that we perish? I mean, obviously Jesus was in the same boat with them. And God cares. God is the one who does care. So, when you wake up and you find the election didn't go your way, God had a reason for it. And we don't always know what's best, do we? None of us do. We don't always see it's we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what that means is that we trust that God is going to bring his kingdom to this earth no matter who's sitting in the White House or the prime minister's residence or whatever. Who the Queen of England is, the King of England, it doesn't matter. God's, God knows how to bring his kingdom to this earth. He knows how to do it. God has been running nations and setting up and bringing down nations and kings since long before you and I were born. So don't, don't think that we failed God, and that's why Trudeau is now still the Prime Minister of Canada, because we failed. We fail God all the time, and he still gives us manifest blessings. I mean, you woke up this morning, you still had clothes to wear, you had food to eat, you had a house to live in. You're still saved. Trudeau became prime minister again, and you didn't lose your salvation over it. And I'm not being mean. But I am, I, I've, I've, I've asked God these questions before. Because I wanted to know the answer. And it's just that simple. God is sovereign. God does what he wishes. God does what honors him. And God knows how to get honor out of this situation. And you see, people, we, as Bible believers... In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation are going to shine as lights in this world. If it's still daytime, how can we shine? So let it, it's going to get dark. It's, it's going to get dark and it's going to get darker. I'm not thinking that Donald Trump has to win the next election in order for God to still be 
on the throne in heaven. If I lose this country here in this world, I've got another one in heaven, a better one. Take away everything that I have in this world. And I have an inheritance laid up for me in heaven where moth and rust doth not corrupt. Fire can't touch it. Nothing. My old friend Noah Hutchings would say, God is still on the throne. Prayer changes things. Um, our food distribution program is... Um, we are on course for a December feeding in Kenya. Um, I've already had people respond to that and uh, with prayers and whatnot, and I appreciate that. Uh, we talked about maybe some sort of a little toy distribution in Kenya. Now, I, let, me, let me address this because we got a, a call apparently from somebody who wants to make things to send to the children in Kenya. And we've had other recommendations, and I appreciate all that. But understand that we have to, we have to select something that we can actually get to the site for distribution, which means we have to get them in this country and go to Kenya with them and get them in and that's all I'm gonna say about that uh, because there are people who are in Kenya now who are listening and our resources and our space is limited as to what we can carry it's basically Michael going by himself and he's gonna buy an extra suitcase and stuff it full of stuff is what, how it's going to happen. And so I, my sincere thanks to those who have offered to make things for the children in Kenya. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just respectfully ask you to hold off because we can't get them over there. We're going to have to really brainstorm and figure out what it is that we can take over there uh, for the children, and it may not work out that we can even do that to begin with. We may get it all confiscated. I don't know. So uh, just pray for us on that, and and I appreciate, like I say, those who are praying, and uh, pray for Michael, and he's going to try to work this trip out so that he's not gone Christmas, because normally he is. Uh, continue to pray for Sweetie Pie, her next... Surgery is November the 19th, and it's going to be a pretty rough, hard surgery to heal up from. And um, so I appreciate your prayers for her for that. Take a Bible. Turn to the book of Proverbs uh, chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9. This is, uh, you know, like I said earlier, I if, if I want philosopher's wisdom, I'll just read the Bible. I'll read the book of Proverbs, and I get all the wisdom that I can handle from the book of Proverbs. That way, I, so what if it's so what if I can't put on my resume that I read Aristotle? So what? I read Solomon, and that's better. But I was reading this this morning. In fact, let's let's do this. Let's let's just. Uh, Let's just break open a can of uh, King James Bible here. Let's just go to Proverbs 9. Proverbs chapter 9. Um, yeah, there we go, right there. Let's read a little bit of this. Uh, wisdom, wisdom hath builded her house. Now, some people have erroneously attributed this wisdom to the Holy Spirit and then say the Holy Spirit's a female. No, he's not. No, he's not, because that would introduce a contradiction in Scripture. The Holy Spirit is 
often, not exclusively, but often referenced in Scripture as masculine. Never in the feminine. He's a guy. Male. So, wisdom then can't be transgendered. Can't be. So it's not that. It's But anyway, wisdom hath built her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. And that's what got my attention this morning. What are those seven pillars of her house? What is her house to begin with? She hath killed her beast. She hath mingled her wine. And say, what does that mean she hath killed her beast? Well, let me throw this at you. Romans 16 says, may the God of peace... Bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Meaning the feet of the church. Now the church is rendered as a female in the scriptures. And, and for a real genuine reason. That's because the human soul is rendered as a female in in the scriptures, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. That's the book of Psalms. So I, be, I do believe that the human soul is rendered as a female. So that makes sense now. Christ is the bridegroom. The church is the bride. Seeing that our it's our soul, not our flesh, that he's joining with. So, you know, think of it that way. She hath killed her beasts. She hath mingled her wine. She hath also furnished her table. So, th when you think of this, think of the role and the ministry of the church. The local body of believers. Or you could even say the universal body of believers. Because I don't have a problem with that. I don't believe that my church is the only church. There have been Christian people saved for thousands of years that God has rendered as part of his the body of Christ. So she had killed her beast, she had mingled her wine, she had furnished her table, she has sent forth her maidens. She crieth upon the highest places of the city. And see, this is the evangelistic efforts of the church. When Jesus gave us the wisdom that's in the Bible, he told us, don't hide it. It's, it's a light. Don't hide it under a bushel. Don't, don't keep it just inside the four walls of the church. Take it out to the streets. Go to the marketplaces. Some of you give out DVDs and play. I, you know, we've got a, a, a. Before I ever, before this couple ever moved down here, they sent me pictures of what they were doing up in Wisconsin. It's Keith and Pam um, Kettleson. Keith's now gone on to be with the Lord, but before they ever moved down here, they had, you know, would have, and it's October, all these fall harvest festivals are going on everywhere, all over the country. And they would set up a booth and hand out my DVDs at, at those things. And they sent me pictures of it, and I'm going, God, I don't deserve that. So I thought it was pretty cool. But that's what they were doing. They were out in the marketplace where people are crying out in the streets. Here, listen, take a look, take a look at this video. Watch this DVD. Um... Anytime you pass out tracts, anytime you talk to somebody about the gospel, that's what is going on. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither, for as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Come, eat of my bread, which is the word of God, drink of the wine which I've mingled, which is the word of God, forsake the foolish and live, and go in the way of understanding. He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. How true is that? By the way, the fear of the Lord, wisdom, knowledge, understanding are all part of the seven spirits of God. So when it says seven pillars, I believe that the seven pillars are the seven spirits of God. And it makes sense. I have, led by God, built a ministry using the seven pillars to support this ministry. Those seven pillars are the seven spirits of God, which are in the written word of God, the book of God. Of God, which then I believe is why God has blessed this ministry the way He has. I never foresaw any of the things that God has done with this. I never foresaw it. Eleven, it'd be eleven years in January. Never saw that coming, and yet God's done it because of those seven pillars being the seven spirits of God, you build your house that way. Your house is your family. Your house is your church. Or your house is the patterns of your life. And the decisions that you make with your life, if the seven pillars of wisdom are the ones that you follow in life. In other words, your decisions, the things you decide that you're going to do or the things that you decide you're not going to do, if they fall in line with Scripture, then your house will stand. It'll stand sure. It'll stand forever. But you build it on foolishness and nonsense and corruption, things going to pass away shortly. So, what I did was, I just decided to do, just kind of do like a study of that number seven in relation to the Spirit of God, the Church of God, and the Word of God. So wisdom has built her house, she has hewn out her seven pillars. So, and in fact, there's seven things here. Wisdom hath, number one, built her house hewn out her seven pillars, killed her beast, mingled her wine, furnished her table, sent forth her maidens, crieth in the highest places of the city. Pretty cool. I like it. Tickles me to death. And certainly that's not an accident. Certainly. Because that's part of the text of the Bible. And that number seven just seems to always, if you were to pick a number in the Bible, number seven, because so many things are done in sevens. The creation. The creation of this world and the ending of this world is done in patterns of seven. So you have this seven days of creation, six days of creation, seventh day rest, then to end the world, you're going to be at the end of the seventh day, the seventh millennium, from the beginning of the world. It's going to start out with seven seals of the book being opened, followed by this. when the seventh seal is open, then those angels who have the seven trumpets prepare to sound, when those seven angels have sounded, when the seventh angel shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, and that gives place to the period of the pouring out of the seven vials of wrath, followed by the 1,000-year reign of Christ, which is the seventh day, 
which after that is the new heaven and the new earth, which is the eighth day. So a lot of sevens going on here. We get that idea of what that number seven represents. So we go to Isaiah chapter 11, and we have the seven spirits of God listed out for us exactly what they are. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord, that's the first one. That's, um, that's part of it. Spirit of the Lord. And the Spirit of the Lord, then, if you, when you have the Spirit of God in you, you have the Spirit of the Lord in you. Two things, of course, there could be a thousand things about this. But a couple of things that stand out to me about the Spirit of the Lord is, number one, it identifies who your God is. He's not Baal. He's not Beelzebub. He's not Belial. He's not Dagon, not Ashtaroth, not Milcom, Chemosh, not the planet Saturn, and not Michael Jackson. My God is the Lord. And my God said, I am the Lord. That is my name. And you've got all these sacred name people going, and Hebrew roots people saying, well, the Lord's not a name. It's a title. But God said it was his name. Well, no, he didn't. They translated it wrong. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. They got it right. They were following the leading of the New Testament, originally written in Greek, where every place they're quoting from the Old Testament, and when they saw the four letters, yod heh vah heh when they quoted that in Greek, they wrote out the word Kyrios, which means Lord. So they were following the scriptures. So it's the spirit of the Lord. Number two, the, the second idea about this is that he is the governor of our life. The superintendent, the curator. That's where the word Kyrios, curator comes from the word Kyrios. He is the governor and the boss and the king of our life and of everything that relates to our life. There's nothing outside of God's dominion, especially when it comes to the life of the believer. Nothing outside of his dominion. And I know that. As a born-again believer, I know that I am under the direct dominion of God. And there is wisdom. That's, that's the first thing supporting this house of mine. Is that I know that God's in charge always. Always. You read stupid statements from people in the charismatic word faith movement, like from Kenneth Copeland and some of these others who say, you want to hear the, 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 um, the biggest loser in the Bible? You know who that is? It's, it's, uh, it's God. He lost planet Earth to Satan. Stupidest thing I ever heard of in my life. God lost control over planet Earth to Satan, and you have to give it back to him by pronouncing your words of faith. That is, it's witchcraft is what it is. So, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That's the first pillar of our life. Knowing who your boss is. Knowing that if your Lord tells you, don't do that, you don't do that. Now, if you do do that, you say, well, I did it anyway. He must not be any kind of Lord. Well, wait, wait until the rod shows up. When the rod shows up, then say that. 
Because if God beats you with the rod because you're a foolish child, he's doing it because he loves you, and he's correcting you. And if you won't be corrected, then your house is not being built with the seven pillars anyway. You're a bastard and not a son, Paul says in Hebrews 12. So anyway, that's the first pillar, the first spirit. The spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom. Second one, wisdom is the result of knowledge and understanding. You could throw in there counsel too. Wisdom is the result of biblical knowledge. You know what the Bible says. You know the verses. You may not have it perfectly 100% memorized, but I would work on that if I were you. Knowledge. Then from knowledge comes understanding. Now you're starting to put pieces together. Like a puzzle. You're understanding this piece fits in this location. And the more pieces you put in, the more understanding and the wisdom you get of the big picture. So the spirit of wisdom, understanding, spirit of counsel, spirit of might, spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. There's your seven spirits. Right there in Isaiah. And Jesus had all of those. So by the way, if we were to count these words we would end up with 33. Somebody say amen. That's pretty cool. And the, f the phrase Holy Spirit is found seven times in the King James only. There is not another translation of the Bible where the phrase Holy Spirit is found exactly and only seven times. Not another one. Not even in the New King James. Holy Spirit. And see, it just matches. It makes sense. The Holy Spirit and the seven spirits of God seven times. Genesis 2. This gives us the meaning behind the number seven. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work. So seven has to do with completion, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. Um, and God blessed the seventh day. So it has to do with blessing, sanctification. He sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. So the number seven has to do with rest. There is a day of rest coming. It's in the future. It's not in the past. Because it's going to be the millennial, the 1,000-year reign of Christ. That's the day of rest that is coming, not just to us, but the world. I mean, God even told the farmers, lay off the land for a year. Give it a rest. Give the land its rest. You're going to wear out your land. And we nobody does that anymore. Nobody follows the word of God when it comes to farming. Or I'll say very few do. But by and large, they don't follow the word of God. They think you can break it and, and bypass the regulations given to us in the word of God. And, everything. and so now you've got farmers spending... Thousands and thousands of dollars upon f on fertilizer for their land. I talked about this before. I'm not going to spend much time on it. But that's the, the gist of the number seven and what it means. So Psalm 12 then, pertaining to these seven pillars and wisdom... Psalm 12 is, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Now the word sanctification, sanctified means purified. God sanctified the seventh day, made it holy. It is a holy thing that you do. When you rest on the seventh day, when you commemorate that seventh day as a day of rest, 
God gave it to you as a gift. Likewise, he has given us the gift of his word. The words of the Lord. The words of the Lord. All of those words put together. Every single one of them into the collective called the words of the Lord. They are right now, at this present time, pure words. You will never, you will never win me back over again to believing that my Bible has a mistake in it. Never, it will never happen. Never happen. I've already been down that road once. I didn't like where it led. I'm not going back thinking that things have changed. I believe that every word in my English translated 1611 Bible is right now at this present time pure and undefiled. I believe that. You can believe that too. And I'll tell you how you can believe that. You can believe that because you don't have a verse anywhere, in any place, in any scripture that tells you the word becomes corrupt. You ever thought about that? When all of these doctrinal statements from ministries all over the world in their declarations say, we believe the Bible to be the inspired, inerrant Word of God in the original manuscripts only. They don't have a verse to sustain and support that idea. They don't have a verse that tells them to expect that corruption would seep in to the words of God. In fact, they were told that even though the manuscripts would fade away because they're written on f grass, all flesh is grass, the grass withereth, that even though the manuscripts fade away, God still is going to preserve every word of God. Every one of them. Every one of them. Ask the question, is it in keeping with scriptural guidelines that God would preserve every word intact? The answer is yes. Every single word. And he would not let one word fade away because of corruption of manuscripts. Not one. So the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. It's like God sanctifying the Sabbath day. Anything that's seven is, well, I won't say anything that's seven is sanctified, because the beast certainly is not sanctified. But anyway, the words of the Lord are. They are purified seven times. Now, I don't know why God chooses it that way, but he does. I guess maybe because that's the way God is. He works in known, readable patterns so that we can properly identify his work. Did God do this? I don't know. Is it in order? Yeah, it seems to be in order. Then it looks like God did it. I mean, if you walk out into a field and you see that this field has some apple trees in it, you ask the question, I wonder if someone planted these apple trees. Well, how would you know that? The next part of that is, are the trees lined up in a row? If they are, then a man planted those trees. If not, it's more than likely that nature just took the seeds that, the seeds that came off the year before apples that fell to the ground, rolled down the hill a little bit, 
the seed came out, hit the ground, next spring sprouted up into a new tree, and you have apple trees dotted here and there, but no discernible order. That's how you can tell whether or not nature planted the apple trees or a man planted the apple trees, because there's order to it. That's how you know then that God has inspired the book that you're reading. Is there an order to it? Is everything done decently in order? That Yesterday, I had this thought about teaching this during PMO, Pastor Mike Online. And I may still, maybe Thursday, or I may, I may preach it Sunday. I don't know. But God does everything decently and in order. Does he not? Well, that's how you know whether or not God did it or not. How do we know that God inspired our Bibles? Well, number one, it inspires us. That shows you the work of the Holy Ghost through the words of that book. But number two, it's in order. It was purified seven times. Now, it just so happens. This is a fact. You can take the fact, do whatever you want with it. But a fact is that the decree went out in 1604 from the Hampton Court. Some people that came for homecoming have actually been to Hampton Court in England. I've seen a documentary about it. These tapestries that were uh, in the Hampton Court Hall when King James of England and various people got together and, and when he sent forth the decree saying we're going to retranslate the Bible again. We're going to do it right this time. And I would love to go stand in that room. I, I don't think there's anything magical about it. But to me, it's an important part of human history. That in this room, in 1604, King James of England said, I want a fresh translation of the Bible. One that does not contain all of the notes of either the Anglican bishops or the Puritan bishops. We're going to have a Bible that speaks to both. And I'm sure the Anglican and the Puritan bishops were going, well, that's not possible. That's it, because they hated each other. They did, the, the Church of England and the Puritan fathers, they did not get along. And James said, I'm going to make you sit together in heavenly places, and you're going to translate the Bible. And you're going to keep, I'm going to put, I'm going to put you in committees, and I'm going to divvy up the committees, and I'm going to make sure that on every committee, there's Church of England and Puritans. Just so that no one group controls the translating process. That was God that did that. That was God that did that. Because when you look at, you know, people make a big deal. Well, I think the, um, the Geneva Bible is better than the King James because it was, you know, it came out before the King James. And no, the Geneva Bible is full of Puritan doctrine. They hated kings. And they actually rewrote the scriptures to include that. Did you know that? In Ephesians 6, where it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You go look it up. Ephesians 6 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against earthly rulers, against the, um, what was it, the part of the, about the darkness and then spiritual weakness. They actually had five things that we wrestle against instead of four. You go look at it. They added to the Word of God. The Puritans did. Shows you how pure they were. They had an agenda just like everybody else does. So King James of England said, uh, we're not going to do this. We're going to have a Bible that everybody, that will be appointed to be read in all the churches. 
not just a Bible for the Puritans, not just a Bible for the Anglicans. He wanted a united kingdom. That's what he wanted. So 1604, the decree goes out. 1611, they hand him the first printed copy, and they say, here you go, kings. Here's your Bible. Seven years. It was purified. It went through a seven-year purification process. Now, what I just told you was a fact. You don't have to believe that it means anything. I certainly am not going to tell you that your salvation depends on it. What I'm going to tell you is, I believe that's by divine providence. It looks to me, when I read Psalm 12, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried at a furnace of earth, purified seven times. When I read that, and then I find out that it took them seven years to faithfully recreate not, not just what was in the Hebrew and Greek. Oh, no. They'd, and that's an accusation that the outsiders slam the King James only people with. They say the King James didn't come just from the Greek and Hebrew. Yeah, what do you say about that, huh? Well, um, then I'll read uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. No prophecy of the Scripture is of, is of any private interpretation. What does that mean? It means the translators knew that they could not come up with a unique translation of the sacred text. That their translation had to, had to match what was translated in German, Italian, Latin, Gothic, other vernacular translations that were known at the time. They had to, and, and that's what you see at the beginning of a King James Bible, with former translations diligently compared and revised. They knew that it would have violated Scripture for them to come up with a completely unique translation. Like the difference between the New King James and the King James. Is there a significant difference? Well, according to law, there has to be. Or else Thomas Nelson won't be able to copyright the New King James. There has to be a significant difference. So, I think it's fair to say that when the, the translators were translating or retranslating the New King James Version, their target was to make it different enough so that it's not the King James, so that we can copyright it. That was their target all along. To completely rewrite the King James Bible, which is why I don't read it. And I tell you, don't read it. And I tell you, well, our church, the, the one we go to, they use the New King James. The New King James, by law, is not the King James. And you've been looking at this all along. Psalm 12 is 490th chapter of the Bible. Now, that's a fact. It is a fact. And it's a mathematical fact that 490 is 70 times 7. It is also a fact that it's 490 is not much of anything else either. I mean, it's 49 times 10. But how many other factors are there? You remember factoring in high school? How many other factors are there in the number 490? Well, there's two because it's an even number. There's a 10, because it's based upon the number 10. But that 49 just kind of, that's where you kind of hang up on. 49, it only has one number as a factor, and that's 7. So, 1, 7, 
10 and 2. That's pretty much it as far as the factors of the number 490. And so that's a fact. That 490 is 70 times 7. You may not like what I do with the fact, but I believe it fits. I believe that my Bible is in order. And that order, there's no way in the world that order could have been attained by earthly agents. It had to have been led by the Holy Spirit. So Daniel 9, that we have that number, that exact number, 490, showing up here. Or that exact mathematical formula, 70 times 7. Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the trans... And notice what he says here. The fact, let's, re let's do this. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to, number one, finish the transgression. Number two, make an end of sins. Three, make a reconciliation for iniquity. Four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Five, to seal up the vision. Six, and the prophecy. Seven, to anoint the most holy. Seven things that God is going to do during a period of 70 periods of seven days. Did I say that right? 70 periods of seven days. Did I say that right? Uh, no, because it's years. Where does it say that? Um, well, uh, somebody called in this morning and they said that they examined it in the scripture and they don't believe in a seven-year tribulation. Now, I have good friends that I don't I don't go after them on this on this issue. They're my friends. I need my friends. I don't have very many. And these are men in the ministry that I love dearly. But if you were to put a gun to my head, count backwards from five and say, when I get to one, I'm going to pull the trigger and blow your brains out unless you produce for me two verses out of the King James Bible that says the tribulation is going to last seven years. I would tell you at four to pull the trigger because I don't have any. And neither does anybody else. I don't necessarily think that this has to be 70 periods of seven years because it doesn't say that. It says weeks. Weeks. A week is seven days. And I can show you more than three witnesses in the Bible that will tell you that. I think I can. But a week has seven days in it, not seven years. But anyway, the, the number. Let's get back to the number. During a period of 490, God's going to do seven things. And I believe he's going to do it with Israel. Finish the transgression, make an end of sins, make re reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and prophecy, anoint the most holy. I think that's what God's going to do. Seven things during a period of 70 times 7. So you have that exact formula show up like Psalm 12, 490th chapter, 70 times 7, and you find that it matches what it says because the Bible's purified seven times. Luke 17, 3, take heed to yourselves. I mean, part of what God was going to do was make an end of sins. Make reconciliation for iniquity. So, in Luke 17, take heed to yourselves, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, 
and seven times in a day turn again to thee saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. The words of Jesus that are almost never followed in most Christian people's lives. Right? I mean, let's be honest. If somebody does something twice a day, we don't forgive them. I forgave you once. I'm not going to forgive you again. But Jesus said if they sin against us seven times in a day and seven times ask for forgiveness, we're supposed to forgive them. Now, if you say, well, yeah, but, you know, you figure they're just playing games. Are you? I mean, I'm pretty sure that it's possible to sin more than seven times in a day. I'm pretty sure it is. Would you want God for? In fact, you have asked God to forgive you more than seven times. Did he do it? Would you want him to do it? Yes. So do thou likewise. Let God worry about whether or not they're being honest. Let God worry about it. I have, uh, it's hard for me to learn this. So I'm not going to browbeat anybody and say, I'm a master at this, I'm really good at it, because I'm not. When Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy, my burden's light. I find often that when I'm in a really, really, really deep, sad, depressed state, that nine times out of ten, it's because I am burdening, I have burdened myself unjustly. I have taken on predictions of the future that I have no idea whether they're going to come to pass or not. And those are my burdens, not Christ's. If I take Christ's burden, I find that it's easy because his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. So Matthew 18. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Until seven times. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. 490. Now that number is important. And I'm going to show you why a little bit later on. But to me, it's inter- this is, again, this is a fact. The phrase seven times, I'll show it to you. The phrase seven times is mentioned exactly 35 times in the King James Bible. That is seven times five. That's a fact. It's a fact. You can count it yourself if you want. The computer's not lying. Donna, when she wrote the software, did not embed lies into it. She tells the computer, tell the truth. Give us back, when we do a search, give us back the correct results. And that's what happens. Seven times, mentioned 35 times, which is seven times five. I think that shows God's order over his word, his providence over his word. God did it, and you know God did it because it's in order. It's perfect order. 2 Kings 4, verse 35, Then he returned and walked in the house. This is different places where the phrase seven times is used. Like you have the child of the Shunammite woman. Remember, she built a room for Elisha. And Elisha said, what should be done for this woman? She made me a nice room. Every time I pass through town, I'm like the son she never had. And Gehazi said, well, that's interesting you say that because she never had a son. Oh, she wants a son? I'll give her a son. 
And so he gives her a son, and she tells him, don't do this, don't do this, don't get my hopes up. Well, the next year, she's carrying a little baby around, and she's delighted, and then the son dies in her arms. What kind of God allows that to happen? A God who wants to show forth his glory. So Elisha went, laid down on this child. He stretched himself upon him, and the child sneezed seven times. The child opened his eyes. Seven weeks, seven times. The word purified seven times. The word brings life. 2 Kings 5.10, Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times. That's to Naaman, who had leprosy. And he remember, he brought all these gifts for the man of God. The man of God wouldn't even come out then and talk to him because the man of God, the man of God was signifying unto Naaman, I don't care who you are or how many gifts you brought. I don't accept them. And the grace of God is not to be bought with money or for fear of the faces of men. That was the message of that. And of course, Naaman got infuriated. How dare he not even come in and see me? I'm an important man. Just watching Jordan seven times. I never heard any kind of nonsense. And his servant said, uh, Lord, don't cut my head off for this, but if he would ask you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? Well, yeah, but, but, but why don't you go dip in the River Jordan seven times? What What is it going to hurt you? All right, then. And he does it. And Elisha sent a messenger. Anyway, they, then he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of man of God. His flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child. He was clean. Except thou be as a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Woo! Man, I love that. You see, leprosy is sin. Now his leprosy is washed away. He's sanctified. Purified seven times. You get it now? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. Same thing. And by the way, what is a sneeze? Why do we sneeze? Generally, we sneeze. Sneezes are triggered by some sort of foreign object dust particles or whatever up in our sinuses or our nose and it triggers a process whereby we purge what's what's here which is why you don't want to stand in the way of somebody's sneeze you're going to hit with a flying object i'm telling you okay big clinker coming out hitting you well, it's a purge. So the child sneezing seven times, he, he's being purged. Same thing here. He's washing seven times. He's purifying seven times. Nebuchadnezzar. I love, I, several years ago, God showed me this. Patterns in the Bible. The number four is the number four. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first four chapters of the book of Daniel are about a man being saved. This man is named Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel 1, he's introduced to the gospel that God's way are better than his ways. Daniel 2, he's introduced the idea that God's religion, vis-a-vis -vis Daniel is better than his astrologers, magicians, soothsayers, and Chaldeans. Better than his religion. Daniel 3. God's laws are better than his laws. Right? With the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And Daniel 4. Is that the one true God is greater than than even Nebuchadnezzar himself and his gods. So in four chapters of the Bible, God has taken Nebuchadnezzar through the process of turning a pagan into a believer. 
and it takes seven times. Now, we assume that those are seven years. You know, and I guess there's nothing wrong with that. So we'll assume seven years. It could be seven seasons. Could be. Which would make it uh, less than two years. But we don't know. But it says seven times. So let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. Well, at the end of the seven times, here's what Nebuchadnezzar says. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High. The phrase, Most High, 49 times. King James Bible, seven times seven. Can't make this stuff up. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, including Justin Trudeau of Canada, that was the point I was making earlier. God establishes who he wants. Now, why does God want a liberal ruling over Canada? Here's what I'm going to say to that. Obviously, the people of Canada, by an overwhelming majority, are more wicked than we think. Obviously. Now, there's even some that's touting Donald Trump as the savior of America. America doesn't need Donald Trump to be its savior. I, yeah, I, I, you'll never hear me say that. Now, do I like the man? No. Do I like some of the things he's done? Yes. But God is not going to restore this nation back to its godly heritage anytime soon. There's way too many sinners in America, and most of them are church members. Well, I won't say most of them. I'll say a vast majority of church members are some of the biggest sinners in America. Biggest, biggest cover-ups in America. So anyway, back to Scripture. Verse 35, All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time, my reason return unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness return unto me, and my counselors and my Lord sought unto me. And I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and whose ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. So what did God do with Nebuchadnezzar? through seven times he sanctified him you can tell what you want according to this I can't wait to meet Nebuchadnezzar in heaven I think he's going to be there I really do I mean look what God did with that man does not even a just man fall seven times Now, the, the name Jesus, 983 times. Now, if you go to the Pure Bible Search software, I didn't have this issue with how, when I first did the counting in the Bible, I used a copy of QuickVerse 3.0, which goes all the way back to the 90s, which doesn't work anymore. So, this is... A, a unique, 
I guess, signature in the way that Donna wrote this particular software. If you just type in Jesus, you're going to get 973. Put an asterisk there. Because then it's going to include, if I, if I do this, if I start typing J-E-S-U-S, you see there's three variants here, including Jesus with an asterisk. Now, I don't necessarily consider an asterisk part of the word search, but she did. So, that's, that's what you do. You have 983 times. Now, that's not seven times anything. But, three occurrences of the name Jesus refer to somebody other than Jesus Christ. Colossians 4.11 Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision. 2 Corinthians For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus. It's not Jesus of Nazareth. It's not Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4.8 for if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? And in that case, he's referring to Joshua, which Joshua transliterated into Greek, then translated into English, comes out Jesus. So when we eliminate three occurrences that are speaking of something other than Jesus Christ, that gives us 980 times, which is 490 times 2, which is 7 times 7 times 2. Now remember earlier when I said, how off shall... You know, I forgive someone until seven times. Jesus said, yea, until 70 times seven. So think about it. 70 times seven is 490. When Jesus came the first time, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. He came unto his own flesh and blood people the Jews, Israelites. He would have forgived, forgiven her sins. He would have sealed her with that Holy Spirit of promise. But she didn't want it. She, Israel, was so full of devils that she didn't want it. She didn't want Jesus forgiving her sins. They hated Jesus and still do. He's the Goyim Savior, Messiah. Not ours, the Jews say. Goyim are the Gentiles, and it's sort of a derogatory word. It's the G word, right? So they despise and rejected Jesus. They want nothing to do with him. So Jesus is coming again. And when he comes again, what's he going to do? The seven things during the 70 weeks that we saw in the book of Daniel chapter 9. That's what I believe he's going to do. He's going to forgive their sins. So in Matthew chapter 1, when he comes the first time, all the generations from Abraham to David are 14, that's 7 times 2. From David till the carrying away into Babylon are 14, that's 7 times 2. The carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations, that's 7 times 2, or 14. Add those up, 14 plus 14 plus 14 is 42, which is 7 times 6. You know, and I like it that it's 14 and 14 and 14. That shows in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Godhead being three. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. 
So that's the lineage in Matthew chapter 1. But then we have another lineage in Luke chapter 3 that starts, it goes backwards. Matthew goes from Abraham to Jesus. But this lineage goes from Jesus back to Adam. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed, as was supposed, the son of Joseph. But he wasn't the son of Joseph. And yet Joseph married Mary. But both of them were from the tribe of Judah, which was the son of Heli, son of Methat, son of Levi, which is the son of Melchi. And you, I'm not going to read all of those, but you get down to verse 38, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Woo! And there are 77 names in Jesus' lineage. Now, I used to have E.W. Bullinger's Companion Bible. And he made a lot of notes in there. And one of the notes that he made was, oh, this is a terrible thing that's, that's happened. There's an error in the transmission of text and one of the names should be deleted out of this lineage which would make it 76 and I'm going oh I don't think so I don't think you ought to delete a name out of this lineage leave it with 77 because it just sounds right to me because I think God's a God of order and I think that number seven wholly involves the work and the ministry of Jesus Christ when he came to the earth the first time. Um, Matthew 16, I, I will say also unto thee, thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. See, the word church is found 77 times, and this is the first occurrence of it in Matthew 16. We have 77 names in the lineage and the church is mentioned 77 times. Now, the 77th occurrence of the word church is Revelation 3, 14, under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Now, I'm going to give you a fact. The 77th verse of the Bible is Genesis 3, 21, and it says, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Now, what does that verse, the 77th verse, have to do with the 77th occurrence of the word church? I want you to notice that it's the Laodicean church. And the Laodicean church is naked. So Jesus says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be, be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Somebody say amen. Isn't that neat? 77th occurrence of the word church, you find out that that church is naked. The 77th, 77th verse of the Bible tells us that God had to make coats of skins and that to Adam and Eve because they were naked. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. That's the seven spirits of God. The Holy Spirit, seven times in the Bible. The spirit of adoption is the spirit of his son, Jesus Christ, whereby we cry, Abba. It's what little Jewish boys or girls, when they first learn how to talk, Abba. They don't say Mississippi or Sesquicentennial or anything like that. They say Abba because it's easy. It's just the lips coming together. Abba. This is your, your papa. Your dada. We're like little babies. 
in the sight of God, compared to God, we know nothing, absolutely nothing, and we can't care for ourselves. Our Father must do it. The Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now, the reason why I bring this into that is the 77, the 42 names here, Matthew 1, means Christ is of the lineage of Abraham. The 77 names here shows a direct scent from Christ through David, through Judah, to Abraham, through Abraham, all the way back to Adam. So, and notice that Adam is the son of God. So, the lineage... You trace your lineage so that you can receive your heritage, but also your inheritance. And that's what salvation is. It's an inheritance. What do you have to do to receive an inheritance? Be born. And who controls that? The baby? No. The father does. He's the one that controls that. Galatians 3.29, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So in Galatians 4, we have another verse where the word Abba is used. Now, I say that the heir... As long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. And what that's saying is that, let's say you've got a king, and he's on the throne, and now he's got a son. Now his son is not the king. He's still a child, and as such, then, he's no different than anybody else in the world. But he's the son of the king. And in due season, then, he will inherit the throne. But while he's a child, he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. It's a crude, it's a crude, sort of a crude illustration, but it's one that I know. In the St. Louis area, we have, St. Louis is the headquarters for the Bush Budweiser Brewing Company, Anheuser-Busch. And for years, it was owned exclusively by the Bush family. It was German immigrants coming from Germany to St. Louis, and he started this brewery in St. Louis in the late 1800s, and... You know, then they built this empire. And Gussie Bush, who owned the St. Louis Cardinals back in the 80s, back when I was growing up, his son took over the reins when he died. And when his son got out of high school and got out of college, August Bush the fourth is the college boy. August Bush the third takes college boy August Bush the fourth. And says, you know, eventually you're going to run this company. So in order for you to do it right, I'm going to put you to work. Now, report to the loading docks. And it's exactly what he did. He made his son report to the loading docks. He said, you're going to load. You're going to load beer trucks. Then you're going to work in the mail room. Then I'm going to make you work in the brew house. And then I'm going to make you work in the tasting station. Then I'm going to make you work for one of our distributors. And that's what he did. To train his son so that his son then doesn't just, he's not just a kid born with a silver spoon in his mouth. 
he actually knows because he was treated no different than and he told the guy I, I this is my son but I don't want you to treat him any different than you do anybody else started out in the loading docks and that's what that means why did God who eventually we're gonna become rulers over this world for a thousand years but we are not born by any means with silver spoons in our mouths we are under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father, and so was Jesus. Even so, we, when we were children, were in the bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth a son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you have the word church 77 times. Jesus, uh, Christ lineage, 77 names. It's because we are joint heirs and we're treated like joint heirs. If God sent forth his son into this world to live under the elements of this world, then so must we. Now it kind of puts it in perspective why we go through so many hardships. He that has suffered has ceased from sin. That's what Peter said. In Galatians 4, Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. But we have to start out being a servant. Verse Now, verse 29, same chapter, But as then he that was born, and he gives this illustration of Hagar, Ishmael, Sarah, and Isaac. Hagar and Ishmael, Ishmael cannot be the heir. Cannot be. So that was Sarah's mistake. Maybe, maybe God wants you to sleep with my bondmaid. But that's how it's going to happen. I'm an old woman. Abraham's going, you want me to what? Darling, you'd have killed me a year ago if you'd have caught me doing this. Now you tell me to do it. But it created problems. As then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Even so it is now. I will encourage you. And, I, and do not, do not lose sight of who Israel is. Do not let some internet foolery Give replace Israel. Don't do it. Now, having said that, I will say I have absolutely no doubt at all that some of the biggest conspirators against Bible Christianity in this world are Jewish. I know this because I've read the book of Acts. That as then, so it is now. During, in, during the days mentioned in the book of Acts, the people who hated the gospel the most were the Jews. It wasn't the Romans. It was the Jews. When the Jews said, we're going to take him out and kill him. Centurion, come over and arrest this man. We're going to kill him. And then the Apostle Paul said to the centurion, um, are you going to deliver me to the hands of these Jews? I'm a Roman citizen. You're a what? I'm a, yeah, my father was a Greek. I'm a Roman citizen. I have rights. Sorry, folks. He's a Roman citizen. Rome didn't have the problem with the Apostle Paul that the Jews did. They Now, I'm not saying they didn't have a problem. Because clearly they did. But the Jews, did, the biggest persecutors of those who preach the gospel in the book of Acts were the Jews. And it's like this. Those who are selling religious indulgences, 
such as Judaism, such as Hebrew roots and sacred name, such as the Catholic Church. I put them all in the same pool together because they all have a works-based or a performance-based blessing from God. If you can cut the mustard, then God will bless you. But if you can't, then you get nothing, is how they believe. And they hate, they hate those of us who teach the gospel of grace by faith. It's that simple. Nevertheless, verse 30, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Titus 3, 7, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Hebrews 1, 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? See, and, and this, is what, this is what heaven is. Just like the land promised to Israel, we seek a better country. Given to us by virtue of our second birth. And I'm going to say this. I don't know if there's anybody listening. If you cannot ever remember a day when you got down on your face before God and begged God's forgiveness for the very first time, I think I would make today that day for your own benefit, for your own good. Because you're not going to get heaven simply because you're right on all the political ideologies and you're right concerning all the conspiracy theories and you're subscribed to both Mike Hoggard and Alex Jones. You are saved to receive the inheritance of Jesus Christ by God's grace through your faith in what God said. And it is a birthday. It is. Just as I know the date of my birth. I know the date of my birth. Do you remember when Christ came into your heart and cleaned your life out? If you don't remember that day, and I'm not saying it didn't happen, I would make sure. God, I don't know if I've ever been saved, but right now, save me. <clears throat> One of my favorite gospel singers, Mark Trammell, sang with the Kingsmen. He sang with all the top groups, Kingsmen, Cathedrals, Greater Vision, Gold, Gold City. Now he has his own group, Mark Trammell Quartet. He sang for the Kingsmen and the Cathedrals. Grew up in church. Realized one day that he was lost. I mean, he just took it for granted that he was saved because he grew up in church and was singing gospel music. And he said, I realized I had a great big dose of religion, but I'd never been saved, never been born again. It's possible, people. It happens. So that's why I'm, you know, bring this out. If you cannot ever remember a day being saved, remember this one and ask Jesus into your heart to save you. Because heaven, then, is an inheritance given to those who qualify by birth. Are you catching that phrase? Uh, Hebrews 1.14, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? 
Hebrews 6.18, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope of set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Um, James 2, 5, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him. The heirs of the kingdom are the ones who are going to inherit the inheritance. The inheritance is given by rights of birth. It is your birth right. Now it has to be proven, though. It has to be proven that God indeed is your Father. So in the 21st century, how do we prove that? DNA, which is a book. So, yeah, I think it absolutely does matter what Bible you read and believe. I think it absolutely matters. There's some of you out there that, you know, you've contacted us and you said, you know, the King James has been my Bible ever since I got saved. I love that. But then there's others out there who say, you know, I, I guess I got saved at an NIV church, but then God later showed me that it's the King James. Am I saved? Yeah, I think you are. Because God brought you around to it. He brought you to a place in your life where he showed you the truth. Because the DNA matters, does it not? Now, if you present to me a, a young man with oriental features and dark skin and try to convince me that he's my son, I will say, I think I want a DNA test on it. Or, I'll say it like this. If you try to bring to me a child that was born from some other woman than Lisa, I will say, that's not my son. And if you say, well, it is too, I'll say, okay, let's do a DNA test. I guarantee it's not. The DNA matters. The words that are in our book matters pertaining to the inheritance. You cannot be an inheritor of God the Father's inheritance if you are not His Son. If you watched the Watchman broadcast that's, that came out Sunday, some of you were waiting to hear this story. Nancy Tremaine talking about the alien baby that she had. Now, I don't know if she had one or not. I don't know. She claims she did, and she claims that the father was a reptilian dragon-looking guy that she had to call master or mister. Same thing. It is needless to say that her child does not qualify to be Jesus Christ anytime soon and won't qualify to be Jesus Christ anytime soon. But I can tell you what he might qualify to be. Son of Belial. Well, how can you judge that? Uh, well, he looks like a reptile. So I would say, nope, that's probably not Jesus Christ.
DNA matters. They even know this in Africa. DNA determines who the father is. DNA matters. And the DNA of a born-again Bible-believing Christian is the Bible. That's the seed that conceived us all. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now, it's interesting that when Joshua goes out to survey the land for the inheritance, look at what it says. Give out from among you three men for each tribe, and I will send them. And they shall rise and go through the land and describe it according to the inheritance of them. And they shall come again to me. And they shall divide it into seven parts. Judah shall abide in their coast on the south. The house of Joseph shall abide in their coast on the north. And ye shall describe the land into seven parts and bring the description hither to me that I may cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. So in verse 9, the same chapter, the men went out and passed through the land and described it by cities into seven parts in a book and came again to Joshua to the host of Shiloh. Isn't that neat? That Joint heirs, the church, 77 times, matching the lineage of Jesus, 77 names, and the inheritance was recorded in a book, seven parts in a book. God's a God of order. He is a God of order. Showing us, giving to us, this, this right here, is the book of the inheritance divided into seven parts written down written down is it important that it's written down oh you bet it is so revelation 5 i saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and in the, on the back side so there's your inheritance book right there that's where it is Sealed with seven seals. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? So in verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, which that takes us back then to the seven pillars. Seven pillars are the seven spirits of God. The seven horns, seven eyes, which, I mean, it, I admit it, sounds weird, looks weird. But I guess when I see it, I'll fall down and worship him who has seven eyes and seven horns and won't think it's weird. But those seven horns rep and represent the seven spirits of God. So you remember Samson then. His seven locks are a prototype, a foreshadow of the seven horns of the Lamb, which are the seven spirits of God. What does Delilah want to do with those seven locks? Shave them off. That is another way the devil is eliminating Bible reading, Bible believing, Bible meditation out of your life. He will load your morning up and your day up with enough things, even some things that you would say, well, uh, that was me serving God. He'll load your day up or my day up. Well, you know, I was visiting with somebody and I didn't have time to read my Bible. Doing a good deed for Jesus is never an adequate replacement for reading the Bible. Never is. If I need, if my physical body needs food, so does my soul. And the only place for my soul to get it is from reading the Word of God. Period. 
sold as the lamb came and took the book out of the right hand of him that said, by the way, the word lamb with a capital L, 28 times, all in the New Testament, seven times four. Mm. That It's in order. The word book or books, 196 times, that's 49 times four. Seven times seven times four. The phrase, son of man, 196 times. Seven times seven times four. The phrase, Jesus Christ, 196 times. Exactly! Seven times seven times four. That Bible is in order. I love it. I just run out of time. Run out of time. How much more did I have left? Oh, man. I got a ton of stuff left. Maybe I, maybe I can talk some more about this. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah, I got I to show you the rest. Thanks for letting me have some fun today. I needed to have fun today. You're the reason why I do what I do. Think Bible, people. It's the only way to go.